Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to today's webinar titled Micro Learning, Creating Meaning Meaningful Learning Connections. This session is being recorded and the archive will be posted to the UCI DCE On Demand Recordings page. My name is Lisa Huang and I'm a program manager here at UCI DCE. Here's a brief outline of what we are going to cover in this webinar session. First, I'll start off with a quick overview of Zoom features so you'll know how to submit questions throughout the presentation. Next, I will be giving you some information about our e-learning instructional design certificate program, which is a fully online program. I will cover the requirements, fees, and details regarding upcoming courses for our summer quarter, which begins June 25th. I will then hand it over to our guest presenter, George Hanshaw, and at the end of his presentation, we will have a brief Q&A session. Finally, I'll leave you with my contact information so that you can send over any additional questions that we didn't address. If you encounter any technical difficulties during the webinar today, please send a chat message over to John from UCI Support, and he will help you troubleshoot any issues. If you have a question for George regarding the content of this presentation, please submit it in the chat panel, and we will address it at the end if we have time. Now, George has also included some slides in his presentation where he asks for audience participation. So when we do get to those slides, or if you have any questions that you think of during um, his portion of the presentation, please, again, feel free to submit it in the chat panel, and you'll just wanna submit it to all panelists and all um, attendees, and that way everyone can see your questions and any responses. Here's a brief overview of the e-learning instructional design certificate program. Our program provides the knowledge and skills needed to develop and deliver training online. Taught by industry experts, the program will help you become proficient in all aspects of e-learning, including the design and development of interactive lessons, project management, evaluation and assessment, and more. As a student in the program, you will get hands-on experience with our learning management system, take part in an online learning community forum, receive individualized feedback from instructors, and also have the opportunity to network and learn from others in the field. Our program is designed for a number of audiences, individuals who are completely new to e-learning instructional design, training managers and coordinators, HR professionals, and individuals who have taken on a training role within their department. Now, if you currently deliver face-to-face -face instructor-led training, your company may be asking you to switch to e-learning as they recognize the value of training online. In order to be successful in our certificate program, students should be comfortable navigating software applications and learning management systems. The certificate program is composed of six required courses, which add up to 15 units total. To be eligible for this certificate, students must complete all six courses with a letter grade of C or better, as well as a completed declaration of candidacy form. Now, since there is a small candidacy fee, I usually advise students to take a few classes in the program first before they declare, just to make sure that they do want to complete the full program. And as I mentioned before, our certificate program consists of six online courses. The required courses are listed here below. We have principles of e-learning instructional design, exploring e-learning development tools, designing and developing interactive e-learning courses, project management for e-learning professionals, e-learning evaluation and assessment, and the e-learning instructional design practicum. Each course is 2.5 units and will run for eight weeks online. And we do recommend that students start off with the principles class and follow the sequence of courses as shown on this slide. The curriculum has been developed to flow from one course to the next, so taking the courses in this sequence is beneficial. And you will want to note that there is a prerequisite for the practicum course. You must successfully complete all of the other required courses first before enrolling in the practicum. In the upcoming summer 2018 quarter, we are offering the principles course, exploring e-learning development tools, project management for e-learning professionals, and the practicum course. Each course is listed here with its start and end date, as well as the online course fee of $645. Enrollment is currently open and students may enroll either online or over the phone by calling our student services office at the number provided. We encourage students to enroll early as these classes do tend to fill up quickly. 
Each course in our program costs $645, so you're looking at a total of $3,870 in course fees for the six online classes. Now, you don't pay the entire total upfront. You simply pay for each course individually at the time of enrollment. And there is also a $125 certificate candidacy fee for the program. So in the end, you're looking at just under $4,000 for the entire certificate program. Please note that amount does not include textbooks, which some courses may require. Textbook information is posted on the enrollment page, so you'll know if course materials are required for, before you enroll in a class. And also, prior to enrollment in the practicum, students must purchase, or you may have um, otherwise access to and gain working knowledge of an authoring tool, such as Articulate Studio, Storyline, Adobe Captivate, or other. So therefore, software may be an additional expense. And I'd like to specifically point out information about a special discount that we offer for the program. We currently offer 10% off course fees to members of ATD San Diego, Orange County, and Los Angeles chapters. If you are a member of one of these chapters, please feel free to visit the chapter website for more information about the discount. And here's a screenshot of our online course schedule, which always has the most up-to-date information. You can enroll in any of the available courses by clicking on the green online button. And where you see to be scheduled, that indicates when a particular course is scheduled to be offered, but registration just hasn't opened up yet. So as you can see, we don't offer every course every quarter, so you will want to plan ahead. All right, at this time, it is my pleasure to go ahead and hand the presenter role over to George so that he can provide an introduction and begin his portion of the presentation. Thanks, Lisa. And my name is George Hanshaw. I teach designers and, and instructors how to create and facilitate main, meaningful learning connections for learners. And today, I'm going to show you how to create those meaningful learning connections using micro learning. And I have uh, many years of practice and experience within I have many years practice and experience within industry and the utilization of micro learning. We implemented a lot of this uh, within industry in various different shapes and formats. And one thing that makes micro learning so fascinating is that it lines up specifically with all the learning research and all the psychology research. It makes for a uh, perfect blend of how we learn and get to uh, uh, facilitate learning within ourselves and create those learning connections. There we go. So I want to say the micro learning creates that bridge or links effective learning, meaningful learning with the different aspects of our psychology and learning. We use, uh, you've probably, everyone here has probably heard of andragogy, things like that, uh, transformational learning, all of that. So micro learning gives us that bridge or that link so we can actually use all of this stuff. So this is how we're going to jump in and learn all of this today. I'll give everybody just a minute to read that. So let's first define micro learning. Well, as you think of micro learning, what is one of the first things that you think of when, when you think of micro learning? Type into the chat box what you think of when you come to the term micro learning. When someone said that or you saw the title of this, what's that first thing that you thought of? Type it in. Very short. So uh, Amar says small chunks, many small chunks, manageable, self-contained. I love all the uh, all, all of the engagement here. Video content, video content is huge right now. Just in time training, very focused. Those are all excellent uh, aspects of micro learning. And when we think of micro learning, let's think from uh, the perspective of creating those connections and why they're so important. Because learning is all about creating that connection between the learner and the content. And micro learning, it makes sense. Does micro learning not make sense to anyone? Because uh, Horton wrote a book and did a lot of research about rewiring our brain. And with all the technology and everything, we are naturally learning from a micro perspective these days. And what that means is we're taking all these small chunks. We love the video. We want things to be very focused. So that all speaks into the different research. And micro learning is everywhere. It's very powerful and it's very flexible. So for us to utilize this as designers, instructors, uh, managers, we have to be flexible as well. So with that being said, um, 
Oops, we did that one. We're going to take a look at some examples. We had some excellent uh, content here that you put in. Laura's talking about learning small things that connect to each other, a single topic. Learners are in control of their learning. So those are some of the key aspects we're going to talk about. And we're going to right now look, I want you to type in your chat box when you see these, are these micro learnings or are they not? So just type in a yes or no when you see these examples. So we shall see. Would you consider this a micro learning? It's a GIF. And what's it showing? It's showing a bolt going into a nut. Yes, yes, no, a couple more yeses, a lot of yeses, some no's. And this brings us to a fantastic opportunity to discuss micro learning. Depends on the, Shoshana, that is fantastic. Depends on the context. So you, that is exactly what the whole purpose of this is. One time we were actually looking at a job check, a test that a company made, and one of the tests in there was, the per, it was for a trainee position. So they didn't have to have any mechanical uh, knowledge or capability yet. They were gonna be taught all that. And one of the tests was, it was a box where you couldn't look in, but you had to thread a, a nut onto a bolt that was welded into this box, but you couldn't see it. So does anybody know the secret on getting a nut onto a, onto a bolt when you can't see it? Does anybody know the secret to that one? I know we probably have some folks with a mechanical background here. <laughs> Righty tighty, thank you, appreciate that. Line up the edges, Leslie says line up the edges. Absolutely, well there's a, there's a secret. You put the nut on the bolt the best you can and you spin the opposite way. So you go counterclockwise, you fill a seat, then you spin it clockwise to tighten it and that way you don't get thread strip, things like that. Didn't realize you were gonna get a quick course in a how to thread a, a screw onto a bolt, but here we are. So you, the company was receiving federal funds, so they could not disqualify people from the hiring process because that took us, what, 15 seconds to say that? So I'm gonna go back to Shoshana. The context is everything, because all they had to do was make a little GIF that had words come up, say first, you know, with the steps, place the nut the best you can, and rotate counterclockwise, fill it seat, ro rotate it clockwise. And it literally took that long. So that's why it context is everything. If it didn't have that meaning, it wouldn't be a very valuable micro learning. But so think in terms of GIFs and as small as possible to make it meaningful. How about this one? Give this one a second though. There we go. We got to see some moving parts here. Could we consider this one micro, micro learning? Let us know yes or no. Okay, we got a no. Felicia says no. Anybody else who wants to jump in? We got a, we got a yes. Fantastic. Well, kind of all comes down to context as well, doesn't it? Because this is showing how the process, yes, is part of a bigger process. Excellent point. We're seeing the, the uh, soldering iron come down, the solder come out come in and then it's snapping off at the same time for this printed circuit board. So we could consider this to be a micro learning. And I noticed in our chat forum when we first started, some people said uh, just in time training, things like that. So I want us to think about when we could start applying this, even though we're not at that point yet, start thinking about that. Now let's take a look at the next one. This is a video made by HR360 and they have a lot of these uh, short videos, and this one in particular is how to deliver negative feedback fairly and effectively, and it's about four minutes long. Yes, yes. What are some others? Yes, a lot of yeses. I like it. Well, I, I must have picked a good one. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, everybody likes this because when is this meaningful? So let's say if you're a manager and you have to give some negative feedback, but you're lucky enough to have a great team and you don't have to do it very often, this would be a fantastic resource for you where you could just pick that video, click before you have a meeting where you have to give that. Uh, a. Gonzalez, a good coaching resource, absolutely. So these are resources. So we wanna think of micro learning from the perspective all the way from a GIF to these coaching resources here, Any of anything in between as well that helps. So we're thinking just in time training, things like that. One last one. This would be sort of like a job aid probably hanging up in a shop. What do you think? Would this constitute micro learning? Yes, somebody gives us a yes, another yes. 
another yes. We've got a lot. It can. And A. Gonzalez says it can, and I would imagine that has all to do with concept or context, not concept. So we have a lot of yeses and noes. Now this one, it has a lot going on. So maybe if we trim it up, depends on context again, absolutely. So if we trim it up, because here we have the process of how you lay up the different uh, layers of the composite material that's showing somebody using a roller. So I would tend to say no, unless I had it focus on just one piece, because this has many, many different pieces connected to it. So that would be my uh, take on that, but it definitely depends on the context. So let's look at it this way. So let's finish our definition here. And let's see if we all agree. So we know we need to be flexible. So micro learning is specifically focused content delivered to the learner when they need it and how they need it. And the key components are the learner has control over the selection of the content. Content is less than 10 minutes in duration. That's the absolute maximum. And my personal preference is, is two minutes or less if it can be done but it has to be meaningful and it has to make the uh, point. It, ha it, has to have, it has to give the learner something that they can take away. It can't just be a, a thing. So with that said, let's discover our four micro learning mind hacks. So I like to call this uh, M cubed, make micro learning me meaningful. These are the, this is, four ways of why micro learning works so well. I hope to, to illustrate that. So let's just jump into it. So I'm gonna ask you this. So don't type into the chat box here. Okay, just leave, the, leave that one alone. This is for your internalization. So choose a number between one and five. Multiply that number by nine. I'll give you a second to do that. So we chose a number between one and five. We multiplied it by nine. If your number is a one digit number, remember it. If it's two digits, add the two digits together. Subtract five from your number, and this is your final number. So now we have a final number. So you chose a number between one through five, you multiplied it by nine. If you had one digit, you just kept that digit. If you had two digits, you added it together and subtracted five. So this is your final number. Does everybody have their final number? Just hit yes in there if you do. Don't tell me what it is though. Because this is the whole mind hack. Okay, got a lot of yeses, thank you. Okay, so now you're going to translate that number from a number to a letter. So if your number was one, A, two is B, three is C, four is D, five E, six F. So translate that to a letter. Don't let, us, don't let anybody know what it is though. We don't, want to, we don't want to know the letters yet. So don't put that in the chat box. Now you're gonna pick a country that starts with that letter. Don't put it in the chat box yet. So just pick a country that starts with that letter. Take the last letter of that country and think of an animal that begins with that letter. Using the last letter of that animal you chose, think of a color. So does everybody have their color? Don't type it in the chat box, so just let me know yes or no if you have your color. All right, fantastic. Michelle's got it. Maria has it. Outstanding. Millicent. Okay, so we all have it. So here's the magic. Write the color you came up with in the chat in the chat box, I almost called it a text box. Sorry, Robin, okay. gray, orange, 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 blue, amethyst. Okay, so something of fantastic happened. How many of us had an orange kangaroo from Denmark? And for the hook, yes, outstanding. Ooh, aqua orange, we had some very creative folks. So <laughs> magic, pure magic, I love it. Dominican Republic, that is the one of the only other options that you had. Denmark was the most uh, recognizable and Dominican Republic was the second. So did anybody come up with a koala from uh, the Dominican Republic? Oh, Anne has a koala instead of a kangaroo. So 
What that all speaks to is our first and second mind hack. A koala from Denmark, fantastic, okay. Uh, mind hack, and that's schema. All of us as adults have this magical thing called schema. So all of our experiences and everything else uh, make up our schema, and that's how we see life through. Our brains want to think we're, we're extremely intelligent, so whatever we don't understand or whatever we're looking at, we're going to try to fit to our past experiences in our schema. So obviously the more experience we have, the more schema we have and we're looking through. So in terms of micro learning, and we're looking through all these past experiences, think about YouTube for a second. Is there anyone who has not used YouTube? I, I, I doubt that, but prior, think prior to YouTube, even prior to it belonging to Google, prior to it even existing, the literature all said that learners did not want to have those controls that made them feel uncomfortable with the play button, the pause button, and the ability to move back and forth. But post YouTube, it's expected. So that's a complete expectation, and that matches our schema of learners. So if you're at work and you need something and you want to learn something, your schema wants wants you to know exactly what you need. So that's how it's working. It's taking all your past experiences and it needs to be something that connects. So that, in, in the short term, that means use the tools you always use for work, whether it's a video, whatever it may be. So that mind hack number one is schema. So we're going to connect with all those past experiences through largely our medium, and in this case, YouTube. Like uh, just the other day, I had to change brakes on my car and I had to look up a YouTube video to see how to how to uh, tighten a few things down. And I was able to do it right where I want it, when I wanted it, right in the garage. It was fantastic. Just click play, got a two minute video of somebody changing their brakes. They showed me exactly what I needed to do. And that was, it was needed because it was necessary right there, but I also had that schema happening because it was a YouTube video and I could reverse back and forth so I could do what I wanted with it. That was important. All right, and that leaves us mind hack number two, immediate relevance. So it is absolutely relevant. So that's a big part of our learning with micro learning when we create that connection with the, between the learner and the content. So remember, we're creating a connection between the learner and the content. And the first two ways that, that uh, micro learning does that is through mind hack number one, which it uses things that people are familiar with. So it, connects with their schema and mind hack number two immediate relevance so somebody before said just in time training so just real quick somebody type into the type box into the chat box how you would see just in time training how micro learning could fit just in time training would it be in a set of directions or how would you make it reading meaningful from my as you're thinking about that from my perspective video write in a set of directions. If you have, let's say, directions on an iPad or whatever computer you may have, mobile computer system, you could just one touch, video comes up, shows you that exact process. A GIF, a recipe, fantastic. Look at all these things we're gaining from uh, now. Okay, so our next one, let's go to our next one. My next one is, is one of my favorite ones too. So. As we go to this, we're going to be talking about focus. So I want you, what's your definition of focus? So type in the chat box what your definition of focus is. Okay. Laser concentration, singularity of attention, concentrated energy, paying close attention, emphasize on one thing. Oh, being a single mind, I love that. One of my, I uh, do sports psychology and focus and attention is, is huge. Clarity, one thing at a time, that is so important. Attention to what's important, single out an object, ability to concentrate on a single task, the one thing. And so for my favorite definition is very similar to what, to what you have as well. I'm gonna take a quick rabbit trail for a second. <clears throat> If you've ever been to any youth sport event, <laughs> there's always that one person, I'm not saying it's me, but there's always that one person that yells, focus, focus. 
why would someone yell out focus to somebody playing a game when now that person, that young athlete has to take their attention and put it on that person that's hollering focus. It's doing the exact opposite. So just kind of a funny rabbit trail. Sorry for that. Uh, that's why I love micro learning because I can take rabbit trails. Micro learning forces me to stop that. So we have our definition of focus. And my favorite definition is the ability, focus is the ability of the learner to place their attention where they want it, when they want it. So I have to be able to put my attention where I want it, when I want it. So if it's a, a job, I have to focus specifically on that task. And singular as well, that is hugely important. So we've all been through training, maybe uh, some of us could be training trainers as well, designers. So what are some of the ways that we get in the way of our learner's focus? What are some of the ways that, that we have seen get in the way of learner focus? when we're in the classroom, online, wherever it may be. Too many graphics, useless graphics, cell phones, very technical language, multitask, multitasking, that's horrible on our learning. Going on tangents during a presentation. <laughs> we're just talking about me, and <laughs> that's okay. Death by PowerPoint, words and audio at the same time, poor audio, slides with a lot of text. So that red dot just simulated our focus. And when I took all of those things that we've all seen, distracting music, too much verbiage, repeating things over and over, that covers up our focus. So now it's hard to grab our focus if all we have is one dot in the middle. Moving too slowly, yes. So it's hard to grab our focus if uh, all those things happen because it gets covered up. So think of all that stuff. And for micro learning, if we put too much information, that's huge, that's a big deal. So we, we want to be very focused and specific on that. So as designers and developers, it's our job to create focused learning so the learner doesn't have to, because learners have, we all have many different distractions. Repeat things the learner already knows, unclear graphics, that all gets in the way. So that's mind hack number three. Micro learning, when it's created correctly, helps to create focus. One thing uh, that, that I always loved was when I needed to learn just one specific task for a job, I would get way too much information. And quite often the information that I would get would not pertain specifically to what I was doing. So like, for instance, if someone was doing a composite layup, do they need to know the history of composites to clean a tool with a certain chemical? No, they need to know how to clean the tool. So micro learning is not for all the excess stuff, it's to keep it focused. And that's what well uh, made micro learning does. And it's easy to make micro learning as well. So let's jump into mind hack number four. Are we ready for this one? Short jolts. We already talked about uh, in the beginning, everybody's definition, we talked about short jolts. It is so important because that's, a, that's the reason why they're effective. Now, hopefully I've been role modeling a way that you can do this when you last longer than 10 minutes, such as this webinar, and that's by getting engagement happening. So you want to engage, engage, and change uh, the topic. So we didn't spend more than five minutes on any one particular topic. We moved through different mind hacks, uh, we talked about the orange kangaroo and the koala from Denmark, things like that. So those short jolts are impactful because our attention only lasts seven minutes. But here's the key. With short jolts of learning, we can reset our attention as we go. So these micro learning hacks are effective for face-to-face -face training, uh, any type of training that you want to create. So shorter than 10 minutes, short jolts that are meaningful. And then when you move on or create an interaction, you've reset that attention span. So if you have something else that you need to come across, that's the way to reset a learner's attention span is by changing topic, having them engage, do something. How many of us have been to an hour long lecture and only got one thing from it? Anybody out there or is it just me? You sit through an hour long lecture and you get one nugget of one minute of information all the time, yes. <laughs> Hopefully not today. 
<laughs> yeah, thank you. Thanks, Ann. Yes, yeah, it's definitely not that. So these short, short jolts are so important because that resets us each time. And as we're resetting, people are engaging more and more because, okay, this is, I need this. It's meaningful to me. And that's how when we design these, we have to design from that, that with them perspective, what's in it for me or what's in it for the learner. Uh, because that's so important because we want them to anticipate that every step we go through is going to be meaningful. And that's the whole, uh, the fourth mind hack. And here's a practical example. It might take up a little, uh, this is actually a video that I'm going to show you. So sometimes it takes just a brief moment for it to come up on YouTube. And here it is. So now I just captured this from YouTube. And so now what do we have here? We have this gentleman and he just cleaned a tool, composite tool. A piece of metal would be considered a tool probably. I'm not sure what the exact circumstances are, but he just cleaned the tool. Now the uh, individual, the technician is adding some composite prepreg uh, to demonstrate the layout. How could we, this video is two minutes, but how could we make this into better just-in-time training? Do you want to walk them through the whole process? What are some thoughts? Or can we put this, so let's say if we have a computer workstation right next to us, it's mobile, one video per each step of the product, or process, sorry, in a list, chunk it. Yeah, so let's say we have to tap on uh, clean tooling. Click that, you can get a video now that comes up or a GIF in each step in addition to the video. Absolutely, that's a good, uh, would, would be fun, actually fun to make too. So what we have is you could click on clean tooling. Then you could get the video of just that, it, I think it was about 10 seconds long of the individual cleaning the tool, but you could also add some text on there, maybe use this type of cloth, this chemical, and if there's anything important like uh, ensure chemical is not expired or whatever it may be, whatever is meaningful for the organization, because that's kind of critical is the micro learning is not only hugely effective for the learner, but because we're doing our job in, in a way that's meaningful, it's actually having a benefit for the organization as well. So we can have multiple steps and that is one of the best ways that I've personally found to make uh, micro learning or to utilize micro learning within a process if it's a manufacturing type process. I'll tell you one of the quick stories um, about, about when, <laughs> when, when nobody liked the decision that I made within the training department, but we had a composite class. We were making uh, composite parts for the F-35 and initially we had the instructor designer model so initially the instructor slash designer said okay we're going to start we're going to give the history of composite and they had string and glue and a bunch of other stuff and it's going to be really interactive and what was we have a Toshana put a nice uh link in there if anybody wants to take a look at it so string and all kinds of good stuff in there and i was like wait a minute wait a minute you mean to tell me you're going to start class off at a lecture? And this was going to be a, a full two-week uh, course. Could you imagine starting that off, what that would have been like to first sit through one to two hours of lecture on things that don't pertain to you because you're a trainee who wants to be able to perform a job and you're being told about the history of something? So what I did, which was very unpopular at first, but then it turned out fantastic, was I outlawed lecture. I said, we cannot lecture period. And after a lot of discussion and debate, um, no one lectured. What they came up with was we went backwards. This was a face-to-face -face class, so now we're using a micro-learning strategy face-to-face. -face. Demonstration performance, just like you see in the video, but instead of the video, it was a person doing it. And then they would, in order to reset that clock, the attention span clock, instructor would do it and then say there was like 10 students in there, they would invite a student up to then follow through the process. And what that did, using that reset button, using the micro learning principles that we're learning now, that got everyone engaged. And when the learner would come up, do it for the first time, inevitably they would make mistakes. And that was a fantastic learning experience as well. Because we could say, now I know it makes sense to do things this way, but 
and then we could state why you don't take these shortcuts, why you don't do that by looking at the final product. So that was kind of uh, uh, fun, if you will. Whoops. Okay, so here's our four micro learning mind hacks, schema, immediate relevancy, focus, and short jolts. So that is why micro learning is so effective in the, in the short run slash long run. Now we're gonna decide, here's decide when to use it. So before I jump in and tell you when, I think it's most useful to use it, what have been your experiences with micro learning? Have you seen them used where you're at? If so, how are those decisions made? Was it made because it was just in time training, which is in embedded right in a set of directions? How was it? Usually when people are coming up with different knowledge sets, embedded help, those all work fantastic. So we're all thinking from the perspective of how it can help, how it can be meaningful for that learner because they get to self-select. And micro learning is very connected learning delivered where and when the learner needs it. So the critical components and the key to the decision is exactly that. When do they need these short jolts of learning? And like I gave you a story about when I outlawed lecture, uh, addressing gaps in knowledge, absolutely. When I gave you the story about <clears throat> the composite layup, that was when they need it, where they needed it, utilizing the, uh, the micro learning strategies within a face-to-face -face course. But for micro learning to make it scalable, we have technology now, we have YouTube, we have all the different uh, tools that different companies use. Uh, someone else, Heidi, you've seen this following up after an in-person course to reinforce, that's fantastic. Uh, not well done or distracting, yes they are. So let's take this even a step further. I'd go a step further and uh, say that, make, that using micro learning strategies makes all training a little bit better. Because I don't know about you, but I've sat through some training where I have slept through it. I hope nobody's asleep right now, but I've slept through it. Got up, took the, took the test and moved on. Didn't really learn anything. Except I got to sit in, a, in an air conditioned room for a certain amount of while, certain while. So now let's talk about uh, learning and resetting that clock for a moment. So since we have all these different technology tools, and my suggestion is whatever tools that you have in place within your organization, I would utilize those first. So that's when you know how to, use, how to use micro learning. You define the tools that you have in place already, because remember, let's go back to mind hack number one. You want to link up with that schema. So you want to put your micro learning linked up with tools you already have. You don't want to invent something or come up with something brand new unless it's absolutely necessary. And our micro learning, so if you're going to use this in a face-to-face -face way, Think of that as resetting that attention span, or that attention gap, if you will. Okay, so currently in your context, where, it, where is an opportunity to see, to utilize micro learning? Where do you have something already set, is set up that is just begging for these strategies or for videos or anything else? Dining room server training, yes. And we put time span stamps of different concepts below. Oh, fantastic. So now that's the way that they can be very engaged and just click, boom, this is what I want. Here's my timestamp. Uh, I want to learn topic X. They just click and go right to it. So parts of the technology tool you train, mutual funds 101, your demonstrations why web design techniques are important hospital orientation, which compliance would use it, so do I. <laughs> that would make it those small chunks and just make it meaningful. Single topic for busy people. And we're gonna come, and I'm gonna show you what uh, I just built later on uh, when we get a little bit further into this about single topics for busy people. So fantastic, so there's a lot of good uses for it. So micro learning can fit anywhere. So I hope that we've expanded so far what we think the, the good use or proper use of micro learning is, all the way from a GIF to face-to-face -to -face training. 
I think it's very important to do that. So I appreciate all the interaction here. It's fantastic. All right, so four steps to creating meaningful microlearning. Prepare to be underwhelmed because you have seen this before. No, I'm just kidding. We're going to look at all of this from the perspective of microlearning and effectiveness. So the four steps that you see right here, define the content, talk about the experience, then you create it, and then you add follow-ons for the learning. And I'm going to talk to you about a process that we use here in a moment that use follow-ons and everything else. So Let's just, let me just give you that experience first. And that was with this product we had called the GILS, Graphical Inventory for Ethical Leadership. It was a behavioral assessment because that's psychology is what I do. So we have a behavioral assessment for ethical leadership. And it was meant for school administrators or managers or leaders within a company. And they would take this assessment and it would break out uh, five separate areas. So one was ethical decision making, uh, one was uh, justice and fairness, one was transformational leadership, and, to, and you would get a score on these areas. And all the score, no, nobody's fantastic in every area. So when you got your score, and if you wanted to grow in a certain area, you could click and it would deliver short micro learning videos to you on your phone, because that was the whole thing. We wanted people to be able to go through professional development while remaining on the job because that was one of the things we found that when people leave they might come back with some great ideas but it wasn't discovered there so there's resistance but when people remain on the job these leaders remained on the job and remember the slide before i showed use an add-on well we used an add-on where we connected with the team, with the leader's team, and got them to speak into that leader's professional development on that topic. And guess what happened? All the suggestions were incorporated because everybody felt that they were engaged in the decision-making process. And that all stemmed from micro-learning. And why did we use micro-learning? We used micro-learning because we needed people to stay on the job. And I forget, someone made the point of people are busy in our chat. Uh, chat box here and that was the primary thing we were sending out a specific micro video on a topic on behavioral uh, ethics and a specific behavior and giving them an action item from that so the uh, video explaining what the behavior was talking about it and it was one minute to a minute and a half and then another 30 second to minute delivery on how they need to proceed to engage the team so two and a half minutes, they had everything they needed, and we gave them a tool to engage their team with, whether some people like uh, the use of it. Has anyone used Flipgrid as kind of a video interaction tool where you can do it asynchronously, so not everybody has to get together. You can leave video chats and respond to other people using video. Some people like text, some are anonymous, some are not anonymous. But that was a follow-on that created everybody to kind of connect and feel better about the whole thing. So that was a fantastic use of micro learning. It all stemmed there because as someone stated previously, people are busy. And we always say, so if I'm busy and my attention span is already maximum 10 minutes, if you talk to me, probably maximum of five minutes. Uh, when you do that, you reset the attention span, but you also make it meaningful and that meaning resets it along the way. So now, we had a process that was powered by micro learning that created change. So in the change in this case, it was all social learning. So let's talk about, now that you've heard my example, let's talk about defining the content. So if I'm cleaning a composite tool, do I need to know the history of composites? <laughs> somebody let me know, somebody tell me yes or no, please, please tell me. <laughs> do I need to stand there and give somebody a lecture 10, for an hour about the history of glue and string and how it now forms this graphite composite prepreg, we don't. So that may be great information. I'm not saying it's not great information, but it's not meaningful for that process. And if I'm the learner and I need to know how to clean this tool, that's what I need to know. So that's how we define our content. We strip everything away. And here's the process that I follow. I get really clear on the subject. 
So if it's cleaning a composite uh, tool or something as large as composite layup itself, break it down into specific topics, just like we discussed about when we started. And then I'll define that con content. If I'm the expert, I'll be the one to define it. If I need an expert, I'll define it with them. And then I put it away. That's the magic secret for defining content for me. Um, I actually learned this from my wife who wrote for a newspaper. Let's she'd write an article, put it away, come back to it, and then edit. Because what we tend to do, especially for the expert, is provide too much content. So that's why I would always put it away, especially if I was the expert developing the content. I just put it away, close the file, do whatever I needed to do, take a walk. Now, if I needed to develop this content the same day, I would close it, go for a short walk, do something, but physically change my space, come back, relook at it, and then I would strip away everything that was not pertaining to that specific piece the learner need to know. And then once I did that, then I would, if someone was available, I'd get somebody else in to kind of help me strip away that excess content if there was any left. So it's good to put it away first and then get more feedback later. Kind of how quickly this happens depends upon how much time you have to create it because we all know that if the organization needs it, we have to make it rapidly and we have to make it effective. So what are some ways that you can think of to strip away excess content? Or is that even a problem for you? I know uh, one of the toughest things that I've ever done, so go ahead and just type into the chat room what you would do to figure out what is excessive content. Uh, outline, fantastic peer review before producing. Yes, all this stuff has to be done before producing. Bullet points, fantastic. Cut 10%, less intro text, yes. And with micro learning, do we need an intro? When I review mindset, if I wanna keep it simple, write everything you want, put it, cut it in half. I love it, just cut, cut, cut. Remember, what do they need to know? Okay, Felicia brought in, what do they need to know? That is so critical, because a lot of times we put in information that's kind of nice to know. But remember, this is micro learning. We want them to expect that it's gonna be meaningful. No intro, okay, Ben, that's, that's how I do it as well. I don't, I don't give the intro, especially if it's just in time training and connected to directions. Now, there may be a time when you want like a quick 10 second intro, just to make sure that people understand where we're at, we're on the same page, but I tend to not make an intro as well. Less relevant but helpful stuff is hyperlinks. Absolutely, that's, that's a good strategy. So there's all these strategies that we have to help us define that content. Now, a quick test question. Was anybody listening? What's the second step after define content? Uh-oh. I know you know it. Strip away excess, walk, walk away. Fantastic. Start from the experience. Start from the experience, work backwards. Start from the experience. How do you want, I guess that was kind of a loaded question because walk away is absolutely part of that process. But the next step is start from the experience. So we know the content. Now, how do you want that learner to experience the content? Are they going to be behind a desk like these folks here? I don't know. Where will they be? You know that from your organizational perspective. Are they going to be like me in a garage with their cell phone on YouTube, desperately trying to figure out how to uh, to uh, change their brakes properly so I can actually stop when I'm driving down the street? Uh, find out what the best experience for them to learn. You, if it's something like this, you don't want somebody to leave the shop floor and move and come into an office environment to get on a laptop to see what they need to do. It has to be delivered where they are, and that's part of our uh, definition as well. Mobile learning out in the field, that is huge. Everything that I've developed in the past couple of years has been mobile first, because it's, it's just so important as where they want, when they want. Oh, I want to point out one thing uh, that was said, uh, and this was about stripping away excess stuff. So I'm gonna back up for a minute, my apologies. But imagine you have 10 minutes to sell, tell someone who doesn't speak English well and with clarity. So what you wanna do is you wanna explain it clearly, succinctly, and 
think of it as a person who needs to know this to be able to do a job. And then that would be, and if you could do that on a tell on a, their phone, that's even better because they are right in that environment. So remember our mind hacks, let's go back to our mind hack. It it's, uh, creates meaningful, right? So if they're in the field, it's very meaningful because I'm in the field and I need this information now. I don't need it 10 minutes from now. I don't need it while I'm at lunch. I need it right now and it needs to show me what I wanna do. So one more thing. So if I'm giving feedback, uh, to somebody, remember we used the HR 360 video. If I'm giving feedback to someone, do I need to know the history of language? Or do I just need to know how to deliver this negative feedback I'm about to give within three minutes? Which one would be more helpful to you if you were the manager in this case? Would it be to uh, learn about the history of language starting with Latin? Or would it be to uh, get the information from HR 360 exactly how to deliver negative feedback and get the best performance from it. Yeah, how to give the feedback. So think about that when we start from the experience. What is the most important? What is the best way for that learner to experience the uh, learning? Yeah, no history needed. Uh, so as we start from that experience, think of that experience from the tools that you currently have within your organization. And if none of that fits, that might be a time when you want to look at other tools. Simplifying is always a good idea, but it shouldn't be so simple that it insults the learner, depending on your audience. Let's take a pause and talk about that just for a second, Shoshana, because that's a very good point. So we'll, as we're creating micro learning, we want to be specific on the points and the content. So as you look at it, once you've created your content, you, you definitely want to make sure that it's not insulting. You want to make sure that it is needed, that is meaningful. And that, that's one way that we can kind of guard against uh, simplifying so much that it insults because that's, that is certainly not where we want to end up with this. And I think some of us may have actually sat in training like that where they had this great intention, but it was kind of, oh my goodness, it was very insulting. And it depends on the audience. So that's exactly what we're looking at. So if we're thinking about technicians out in the field, we want to give them precise information quickly. And then next step, create the experience. So you're going to create the experience, use whatever tools that you have there. And as you create that experience, if the tools that you have available are not acceptable, that's when you start to look at the, the other ones. So you can do storyboards, whatever your process is. So micro learning isn't gonna, if you start creating micro learning, it shouldn't change all of your processes and everything. You should just create that experience, but create it with all the, the thought that we've just gone through in that. So as you create it, I always use rapid prototyping just simply because it's flexible and I can do move quickly and make changes quickly. That's how I create the experience. I use rapid prototyping. So what that means is I get the tools, I get the content, I mash them together, uh, see how uh, I can deliver this content generally mobily, like we talked about the uh, administrators and leaders for the uh, GIL experience. Their experience was mobile. So I said, okay, mobile, and I need them to engage their team. So that's how we defined the experience and created the experience. And then follow on. If you need to do something that is needed, you can have a call to action. You could have anything like that. Uh, you can use a flip grid where you create further engagement. So if uh, the follow on could be, uh, for instance, if you have somebody out in the field and they need to know how to change a part on some piece of equipment, the follow on might be go to this video to uh, test what you just did or something like that. So it can go piece to piece to piece. Okay, our last topic. So I hope that I've been modeling these micro learning techniques and strategy and we've been resetting our attention span along the way. So now we're gonna talk about avoiding common mistakes and this is very simple to do. And this is how I do it, HAMP. Connect authentic, authentically, meaningfully, and purposefully. So we wanna connect. In other words, think of our mind hacks. How are we gonna connect? That's, that's all about our schema. 
We're going to use tools that they're used to, they're familiar with. Authentically and meaningfully. Authentically speaks to uh, keeping things simple. Shoshana, that was uh, uh, one of the comments that you made, not to make it too simple to insult. That's why we need it to be authentic. And that's one of our QA pieces there. And then meaningful. Does it give the learners what they need? Doesn't matter what we need, matters what the learner needs. And then is it purposeful? Does it tell them exactly what they need to do? Is it purposeful or are we putting in excess material? Am I talking about uh, glue and string when I'm trying to tell somebody how to clean a, a piece of composite tooling or something like that? So that's how you implement CAMP. Does it connect? So am I using something that's familiar, tools that are familiar authentically? Does it insult or does it not insult? We can keep it that simple. Uh, so is it authentic? Is it what's needed? Uh, meaningful. Is it going to give the learner something that they actually need at that moment? And then purposeful, is it purposeful intent? So that is how to create meaningful relationships using micro learning because learning is all about the relationship between the content and the learner and i hope i've role modeled some of the aspects of uh, micro learning i know we're coming up towards the end so i hope that i've been able to do that because remember it's all about resetting the attention span if you're going over that magic 10 minute mark i like to think of it as a magic seven minute mark but it just depends on what research you look at for the time limit so i don't want to get anywhere near it uh, and then the way to make sure everything is done well is through CAMP, connect authentically, meaningfully, and purposefully. So Lisa, I just wanted to thank you for uh, letting me come and share this, and I hope it was, it connected, it was authentic, meaningful, and purposeful for everybody that was on the webinar as well. Great. Thank you so much, George, for all the information you've shared with us today, and I appreciate how you modeled uh, microlearning strategies uh, during the webinar today. If any of you have any questions, please feel free to submit them in the chat panel. We do have a couple minutes. George, if you want to take a second to just go through your chat panel in case um, someone may have submitted a question while you were speaking. And yes, I, I did see a question come in if the presentation would be recorded and shared. We, we are recording the presentation. It will be available through our website. Um, and I will also be sending out an email probably on Wednesday or later on this week with a link to the recording of this webinar so that you can go back and watch it. Outstanding. Uh, real quick, if I may, I noticed someone just uh, talked about accessible alternatives. Absolutely. You have to, as we create, I didn't really hit on this, and I probably should have. You have to create things that are accessible. And a lot of the tools that we have now, uh, as we design, the accessibility is built in, but we do have to, A, understand what accessibility is, so that might be another webinar, and B, how we can use our tools to create an accessible alternative, because that is hugely important, because if it's a video, we should always have a script that comes underneath. We should always have things like that, that, uh, uh, that are available for someone who needs that, who needs an accessibility accommodation of some type. We absolutely have to design with that in mind. Let's see. Well, I'm glad everyone enjoyed it. Wonderful. And if any of you think of a question after the webinar is over or as you're watching the recording of it, please feel free to send me an email. I've listed my email address here on this slide and I would be happy to forward them on to George. Um, again, thank you so much, George, for presenting on this topic today. Hopefully all of you enjoyed the webinar and gained some insight into micro learning. If you saw any summer 2018 courses that piqued your interest, please remember to register early and consider adding our fully online um, certificate program to your professional portfolio. Again, a recording of the webinar will be sent around later on this week. Um, this slide has my contact information as well as my director, so please feel free to contact us if you have any questions. Thanks again, George. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you.